time is now 114. And a quorum of the board is present. The State Board of Ed meeting of December 7th is called to order. And, of course, business needs to take its own course, but we did have a tentative goal that we're in some of the invites to folks uh, that we were shooting for 2.30, but let's – obviously, we need to do the people's business, so whatever that takes, it takes. But thought I'd give a, a context if we were able to. And the first item is approval of minutes of regular committee of the whole meeting. And uh, by the way, that's my excuse for gaveling a little more than I typically do. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. I, I move approval of the minutes. Support. Moved by John, supported by Liz as a final minute act. Any discussion changes? All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, same. Great. Mr. Strauss. President's report. Well, thank you. Bringing cash to the table now. So. <laughs> well, I gave a lot of what I was going to say in my president's report president's. this morning, so I'm not going to repeat it. But and I, I want to give a. My term as president is ending the end now, and I do not intend to seek re-election as president. I've been in a long time, and uh, I want to give a. A report, but I don't want to. I didn't want to. I wanted today's meeting to focus on Eileen and Carol, and, and I'll like to give that report at the next meeting if that's okay That'd with everybody. Great. So, okay. no I want to mm -hmm. look back a little bit, and several of you both did, but I want to look back a little bit more from when I started as president, which was a long time ago, <laughs> and the, the goals I had then, and what we've been able to do, and so. I that would be great. We'll, we'll, we'll be sure okay. to uh, show that in the agenda. Well, you know, stay the, tuned. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Are going to keep well, us in stay tuned? Oh. <laughs> we'll do a past president. <laughs> well, you actually, you'll be the president in the beginning of the meeting. Yeah. Oh, I still am. Yeah, in the that. beginning yeah. of the meeting. Oh, so oh, okay. We'll sneak it in then. I thought I had the term <laughs> ended with this, uh, this meeting. Not yet. No, you got to elect oh, someone I else. And oh, okay. I hear it's going to be close. <laughs> 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 Well, great, Kat. So we'll. Yeah. But we can also do it later if you'd like, or yeah. whatever feels okay. appropriate. Okay. But I want to I thank everybody appropriately and all that. Oh, well, we've appreciated your. I would like to say something about <laughs> all your accomplishments too, as you know. Yes. Oh, well, thank you. Okay. So good. So that's that's it today. Okay. Well, Eileen's setting something up. I I uh, I, I did want to mention just a few things, and I'll cut mine short. One is that I don't know if I shared this with you, but being a New York kid. I ended up in a bit of a controversy in the New York Times, and it was uh, it was because at a meeting of my counterparts. Where did we send this to you? I think mm -hmm. you sent Oh, okay. You so did. maybe is that your colleague that? Right. I just want to tell you it all worked out because what I was worried about it came out Thanksgiving Day, and that is that my counterparts were meeting, and I'm on the board of the mm -hmm. so-called chiefs, chief school officials. And sitting next to me was the New York commissioner whose decision was to either waive or not waive. Um, now, he was, of course, he has a board and he has regents and he even has a super commissioner of some kind. So he had a lot of other, in theory, had a lot of other folks that were, had interests in this. But final analysis, it's called for that the commissioner makes the call. And it was whether or not that the Mayor Bloomberg's appointment was able to serve. And they worked out a compromise, so that controversy is over. But I got a little worried when Gene Wilhoyt, if you know, he's the head of our association, I think had been head of, uh, if not NASB, then maybe it was no. NAGB no. years ago, <laughs> and, and said he thinks I was in the middle of it. So the deal is just this simple, that I was kidding, and not that I ever do that. No. But it was a private <laughs> dinner, and I didn't expect someone to report it, and that was when David, who's the commissioner in New York, uh, uh, he was born in New York, but his parents lived for an extended time in England. He had a very English accent, and I said, if you are going to, no matter whether you approve or disapprove this, this is getting wide national coverage, you don't want to report it with that English accent. You know, the, the bottom line is, in New York, you'll sound elite and all that. So I got behind him. And I picked him up kind of like a puppet. But again, this is a thing. And I said, I'll do the Brooklyn accent. <laughs> You're, you just tell me what to say and well, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so it ends up in the last paragraph of this 
article that I guess you have seen. But since then, everything's smoothed out. I didn't want to be at odds with Mayor, Mayor Bloomberg. I like going back to my hometown <laughs> once in a while, and that all, all got sorted out. And by the way, I think they did a good thing. They reached a compromise where... Oh, they did? Yeah. yeah. yeah and I think he was able... Yeah. Why he's not a puppet or figurehead of the, the academic person. Yeah. So they yeah. kept this woman, the mm -hmm. one yeah. they brought in? Yeah, but she, she had to bring in uh, an academic person also. Oh, and they, okay. they, I think it, it's a very different situation. I mean, I don't, uh, I'm glad it wasn't my call, but I don't know where I would have been because part of it is it really isn't a traditional superintendency. I mean, there's a, there's a million kids and how many billion budget? Probably uh, maybe, maybe seven or eight billion, I would guess. So, I mean, I think there's room for thinking differently about who leads organizations like that. But I think it's also important that they keep the academics in mind, and that's, the, that's apparently the compromise they were. So anyway, well, you don't have to worry about the me being the problem on that <laughs> count anyway. And then the picture I want to show, this doesn't happen often, so I don't want to, you know, I don't want anyone to, uh, <laughs> Kathy's handing out 20s here, so <laughs> we're all in line here for a $20 bill. She thinks she's in Chicago. We're buying votes over here. <laughs> yeah. You have decided to run again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> five bucks, I'm all for it. All right. Go outside. Oh, okay. Okay. We gotta get serious. Cheap, cheap votes here. Yeah. So maybe just one other thing. I, uh, this was just something that I happened to be uh, invited to a dinner where two people were there last week, and and at the event throughout the day. Just there were a few of us that were these so-called chiefs, and they rotated us that you got to sit at kind of a head table, one at breakfast, one at lunch, and one at dinner. And I happened to get at this table at, I forget, I guess it was the dinner, and got this shot. And I want to show you the shot, first of all, because so right at the dinner is Jeb Bush to the left, and that's Arne Duncan right there. But the reason I wanted to show this is, is this is how Arne Duncan was showing how he gave President Obama those stitches on his lips. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, he yeah. got the stitches from playing oh, basketball. Oh, the stitches. Oh, yeah. And he normally, they blamed Duncan originally. I don't know if you saw this in the yeah. news, because they often play one-on-one, -on -one, yeah. and mm -hmm. they're both pretty good players, but that's not actually what he was doing. Yeah. <laughs> nice try. But it was, a, it, was, it was a very interesting experience to kind of eavesdrop on, on a D and an R, mm -hmm. speaking of our earlier conversations, and some of their um, views of the world and where it's common. I thought it was great that they were seeking commonality. I got to chime in very infrequently, but tried to work something in here and there. But I thought it gave me actually great hope that very much the way I described the board work here this morning, that this is what is going to have to happen in the country, is, is folks are going to have to get together be thoughtful about where they can agree on issues and then, and then agree on reforms. And I, they were both talking reforms, so that was a good, I thought, it was an excellent place. And I'll skip the rest of mine for now, <coughs> just the time, and we'll move to um, action items and discussion and action items. Item K is uh, the approval of amendments to the Michigan Accountability Workbook. Uh, as you know, the Office of Educational Assessment Accountability is presenting this workbook for final approval, approval by the board. Oh. Uh, <coughs> you know, I've done this now yeah, two weeks in a row. I've just got to be more careful with you my... You just don't want to be upstage, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just those two things. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, public participation I kind of did have in my mind because that's we try to do that at 1.30, but please, Matenga, sorry for... Uh, doing that two weeks in a row or two months in a row because it's always an exciting there's no, report. There's no message there, trust me. Not at all, really. <laughs> it's total incompetency. <laughs> please, please, yes. Okay. Um, there was a couple of uh, things that I was, you know, I just got back from a virtual school seminar, so I was really excited to share with you about the virtual school movement that's happening around the country. However, there's also been a conversation that I've been having with my online colleagues and our physical colleagues, of course, 
and I thought that it would be uh, only responsible for me to at least share, and I know this is not a platform for debate, but at least I, would, I want you to understand and um, relate to some of the uh, things that are happening in the, in the, uh, with teachers. And so we are all, um, the, the, like the frustration is uh, growing in the issue of the Michigan teacher tenure debate. And so it's not a, it's not a negative frustration, but, it, but I wanted to share some of the uh, tidbits that we have been talking about as we are addressing this issue as, te as classroom teachers. And so the, the, fr the, the frustration comes from the persistence of educators to um, equate um, scores with learning. And so, you know, we all know in the bottom that, you know, I, I, like it's not really learning, it's not scores, and scores are not learning, but there's this persistence that student test scores is what really determines learning. And I was very, very excited to hear the presentation this morning about the new way of testing students because that just makes, uh, makes the conversation so much deeper and so much better. And so um, we are also talking about the essence of educating the whole student versus, you know, bettering our, sco our scores. And so we are in a race to better our scores, but we are, you know, at the, at the peril of educating the whole student. Because right now we are uh, mandated as teachers, or at least we're encouraged to do the critical thinking skills and the problem solving skills, 21st, 21st century skills, and we keep layering all these skills that we'd like the students to um, <coughs> to have, yet we are still talking about scores as a measure of those skills that they are learning. And so, the, you know, one of the frustrations as teachers is that we are not, um, you know, that the, the debate is not happening in the schools. And so we don't have the professional time to talk about these issues um, in school. And, you know, we do elect um, uh, union representatives that then go on to speak to us, especially on technical things such as, you know, contract negotiations. But when we talk about our own performance in our classroom and our students, performance, it's personal. And so we feel that the debate should begin in the classroom, or at least in the school. And so, you know, every administration, we feel like every administration, whether local or statewide, comes in with their new ideas of how the education can be bettered. And so then that particular idea gets layered onto the idea that was there before. And so we find ourselves as teachers juggling ball, and, and I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, obviously, but we're juggling eggs, <laughs> you know, and the carpet is being moved from under us right now, but the, and we're being asked at this point, but don't let the eggs drop because you'll lose your tenure. Um, and so we are wondering as teachers if this is ha the focus that needs to be happening in this day and age right now. We understand that there are issues with our tenure, there we, are, we understand that, but we wondered as teachers if this is exactly the, the where the where the the problem lies, um, because for us it looks a lot like collective punishment, mm -hmm. and I know that's not the intention, but the feeling when it comes down is collective punishment because there are many elements that cause a student's scores to drop elements, and again, preaching to the choir, but elements such as, you know, teacher furloughs from building to building from year to year. Elements such as class numbers, systemic problems, we discussed some of them today even, um, where the uh, uh, administrators fail to apply for grants. Elements like social issues. But then there's also elements that help elevate student scores that are not measurable, such as the teacher's involvement outside of the classroom clubs, tutoring, personal, the, the, the teachers or the staff or the community's personal involvement. Um, you know, we call this the teacher intuition. We know something is wrong and we go there and calibrate it ourselves. Um, also there is, there is I'm going to give you an example of a student that I have. I, I don't have him this, this, this term, but this student failed my class three times 
and last term was the first time he passed the class. And I, at one point, I remember telling him, you know, should, why don't you take this class with another teacher? Maybe you need a different structure. No, nope, the student would come back and, nope, I want to take this class here. And it turns out it just took him that much longer to grow as an individual. The student was a very angry student. He was very unfocused, and he would just lash out to everyone. And anything that, nothing that I talked to him in my classroom was relevant to what he was going through. But being in my class, I wasn't necessarily in my class, but slowly but surely this student has matured. And this term, he is the vice president of the anti-bullying club that just got formed last month. Hmm. And to me, that personal measure, and not just that, but he's passing all of his classes for the first term ever. And we need to understand that this, the, 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 this student has experienced a personal growth and a whole child growth, and not just that score. Um, why threaten all teachers, every school system, uh, all teachers from all schools when every school system has a different local element that determines the test scores and the student performance? But you should know that the conversation also has lots of hope because we are, and many of us are so <coughs> excited to be teachers today because we have a, a chance and we have the option to be involved. And so I want to also leave you with some of the positive things. We are wanting a chance to create an action plan. And we, because if student performance and education is a defining factor in our state today. And if we intend to truly affect the way Michigan children uh. learn and not just focus on the numbers on the scoreboard, why not provide the teachers to the state of Michigan just the time to, so that we can provide a proposal and maybe even a list of recommendations from the classroom and not just from outsiders who may or may not have been in the classroom for decades. And um, why not give us a chance to provide the ingredients that we know will work, or at least we have the intuition that it will work. So if you will just please give us the time, and possibly even a deadline, so we don't dilly-dally too much. <laughs> and uh, not only will we invigorate the teachers who are disenfranchised, because sometimes burnout is, it, we, we call it burnout, but really it's disenfranch disenfranchisement, I'm sorry, I'm not, yeah. and, um, but also you will gain a lot of our support, and I would like to, I'd like to just, uh, on behalf of just, just the teachers that we've been having this conversation, just ask for the board's support um, to ensure that the alignment of the results that we want are paired with, in, with the things that are measurable. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Can we Fairless? respond to this? I, this is such an important topic, and I know you spoke from your heart when you brought it up, and I think there's a couple of things that, since this is my last meeting, I'm taking the opportunity to, <laughs> to respond. But <clears throat> um, a number of states are way ahead on the uh, discussions with faculty about assessment, and I think it's really important for us to separate tenure, which is a due process issue, from assessment of effectiveness of teaching, which is an assessment issue. And in most businesses, performance reviews are separated from the other kinds of things. So anyway, but um, I just, to give you hope, where teachers have been given the lead in designing the assessment rubrics, they, the product is absolutely fantastic. I just looked at one in Jefferson County, Colorado over my Thanksgiving break, and I was just, in, and it was very much influenced by the teachers themselves and the design over a period of several years because, you know, they've been moving to performance pay in the Denver district and some other things. Um, anyway, I'm more than happy to share the rubric, which is a great outcome, but I think the more valuable thing was the process the engagement, the purposeful engagement of educators in designing an assessment system that responded to just those kinds of factors that Matinga has, has laid out. And I hope going forward as, as uh, this, uh, this state moves to do something, because I'm sure it's on the train has left the station and there's somebody writing it on the, 
thing. I, yesterday I spoke to a group and I, I said that Educator Lois was there. And I said, the train is out of the station, but the educators need to drive the train and not be in the caboose getting the product at, you know, at the end of the, end of the ride. So um, I'll be happy to share that rubric, but, but I would never want anyone to just adapt to be it's the process. But you must engage your faculty in the design of the assessment. They know. They know their or maybe Thank just to another charge I'll put it as PS <laughs> <laughs> just to clarify a little bit though uh, the train has left the station but it is all contingent on the locals developing it for themselves it's it's in the law so it, it, it really has attended to that um, I'm happy about that that it wasn't left to a one-size-fits-all no, uh, no, state no. design so what they're doing, and I'm not sure this is the only way to do it, Lois, uh, but I'm assuming that when local unions bargain this with their uh, boards, which is basically what's going on, that, that they've got some process that they're working out with their individual teachers in that unit, whether it's, <laughs> whether it's uh, Holt or Detroit or whatever, and then you know, bringing that to the table, and then and that's where the voice, you know, so in a way we're luckier than some states, because a lot of states this has been all top down the way it's been well, designed. You know, it's, it's, this it's is all. So it's <coughs> designed locally and all of that, but I really, and not just teacher representatives, I mean, I'm talking about a swath of, uh, you know, elementary, middle, higher, alternative kinds of educators that work with the different populations that the only reason you probably notice a theme with me today, and I apologize for it, but I'm, 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 I've been coached by my folks that I work with after the last meeting that I need to be clearer about when things are, are at a state level and a local level because then the expectation might be that it's ours. And in this case, it's another example where we've already received some proposals for the so-called turnaround schools that Mary Alice has seen that have done exceptional work with their unions to put together uh, thoughtful uh, uh, changes that are going to impact the school improvement and, and put them on the right track. So I mean it gives me more and more confidence that that's, that's going to work and I, I think that's, you know, but it, having said that I thought as you Liz and Matinga were talking, um, there may be a way that we for the sake of discussion uh, we have our own association group in a sense with the network and maybe we ask the network to provide some guidance that would be given to local districts to consider. We're doing that. You're doing that. Okay. Well, you're on it. Good. Well, <laughs> uh, the, board, the state board is a, has a bully pulpit. You don't have to do the work and the department doesn't have to do the work, but you can certainly set the expectation mm -hmm. for, for participation statewide and it can be, it can be come from the president of the board or it can come from a resolution of the board, but somehow or another to uh, inform and advise the universe that there are some ways better than others to go about this process. I just, That's a good visiting point. all these schools, I find that much as we think when something happens here, it goes out there, it doesn't, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, and so it, it doesn't hurt to make statements or do an op-ed or tell our people from the media that uh, that this board is encouraging local boards to have a uh, an engaging uh, practice in fulfilling the requirement. That's a good mm -hmm. point. And I think I think what's important too is that. When we say we want it, uh, we want to have it fully engaged at the local level. We don't mean fully engaged by the by the administrators alone. Yeah. We want right. it fully engaged by the population of that community yeah. of professionals mm -hmm. that do this, so that it's so that it really <coughs> reflects. Um, bec because I agree with Matinga, the professionals know where their pluses and minuses are. The professionals know what they need to really work on. They may not always voice it. And they also know what they really are doing well. Mm -hmm. And so I think we need to honor that as well. Yeah. And often there's no platform to voice it. Right. Um, exactly. Or time or requirement. Well, time and I think that there sometimes is a little bit of a, um, a potential, um, boy, maybe I shouldn't say this. It's right. not going to sit well with someone else that I know that, you know. And so I think that there's, a, there's not a real encouragement to be, to be a leader, to stand up and really say what you believe. Mm -hmm. 
So this gives them that opportunity. Okay, thank you. Public participation. We do have two individuals today uh, who have submitted forms. We're going to start with David Hales from Farmington Hills. He is here representing the Michigan Social Studies Supervisors Association. Good afternoon. <clears throat> David, I've aged since we were together in Farmington, <laughs> and you haven't. What's going on here? Oh, this is a great start. This is a wonderful start. Yes, Mike was my superintendent in Farmington schools uh, many years ago, and then I just missed you at Wayne Risa, too. That's right. That's right. Well, thank you, and good afternoon. My name is David Hales, and I'm the social studies consultant at the Wayne County Risa. I'm here to speak with you today in my role, though, as the chair of the Michigan Social Studies Supervisors Association. This organization, which is an affiliate of the National Social Studies Supervisors Association, is committed to promoting the common interest of social studies supervisors in instruction, curriculum, materials, research, teacher training, and social action. It also serves to bring together social studies leadership in all of the ISDs and RISAs in Michigan, as well as numerous larger school districts and the various social studies discipline-based organizations. I'm here this afternoon, though, to express our concern that the social studies consultant position at MD continues to go unfilled, but to also communicate our desire to work with you to resolve this issue. We believe that there are some created ways to fill this need that also recognize the challenging economic conditions in Michigan. As a core academic subject, and one which is required for high school graduation, social studies deserves leadership in the Department of Education. I recently experienced a situation, which this need was very evident. At a recent Common Core rollout session that I attended, the importance of the Common Core state standards was stressed, and that information would be provided to help guide participants in working through their implementation. Over the course of the day, however, though, social studies was only mentioned briefly by the science consultant, and there were no sessions on the Common Core on the literacy standards in history or social studies for any of the rollout participants. MSSSA believes that representation in social studies is essential in helping educators be successful in implementing these new and important standards. Now, this isn't a responsibility, though, that we feel rests solely on the shoulders of MDE. We're stronger when we work together, and there are many examples in which partnerships between ISDs and RISAs are already providing social studies leadership. One of the best known is the development and implementation of the Michigan Citizenship Collaborative Curriculum. Under the leadership of developing partners at Oakland Schools, Macomb ISD, the Genesee ISD, Ottawa, Berrien, and Ingham ISD, their wonderful work and commitment has provided a high quality resource for classroom teachers to utilize in social studies. Equally important, numerous other ISDs and RISAs around the state are supporting their work through professional development. This collaboration also includes the participation of the various social studies discipline-based organizations throughout the state. Teachers and students are benefiting from this partnership, and they're an example of the many talented social studies professionals in our state. They're passionate about the content and understand the crucial and unique importance social studies plays in developing responsible citizenship. Equally, we have a dedicated group of organizations like the Michigan Council for the Social Studies, the Michigan Geographic Alliance, the Michigan Council on History Education, the Michigan Center for Civic Education, and the Michigan Council on Economic Education that all work closely together in this state to support social studies educators. They're essential partner, partners in providing professional development, and we're eager to have MDE as a partner in this collaboration and would like to work with the board to help achieve this. In the future, near future, MSSSA will be contacting you to put forth some ideas from which we can begin the process of collaborating in social studies leadership at MDE. As I stated earlier, and my colleagues in the social studies discipline of economics can certainly attest, we live in a world of unlimited wants and, unfortunately, limited resources. Still, we feel there are some creative solutions that draw on existing resources and relationships in the social studies community that might be considered. 
On behalf of the Michigan Social Studies Supervisors Association, we're looking forward to engaging the board in this endeavor. Thank you for this opportunity to express our concerns and our optimism for the future of social studies in Michigan. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. That's good information for us. Our other speaker today is David Borth from Big Rapids, representing the Network of Michigan Educators. My mentor in all things departmental and state board related is Jean Shane, who's now sitting at her TV going, oh, what's he up to today? <laughs> Um, I'm here for the network, really sort of to echo what he said a little bit. We've got six, almost 600 recognized educators that are willing to be involved, and our, many of them are involved in what you're doing and will continue to be. But I would be terribly remiss today if I didn't, in behalf of the network, say something about <coughs> Carolyn and Liz and their support of the network and how valuable you've been to the to the state board and you know I've had this opportunity to sit out here for like last seven years and watch you two be remarkable board members um, so in behalf of educators in Michigan and I think I can speak for educators in Michigan those of us in the field thank you awesome job I would also be remiss though if I didn't mention that our network, which is unique in the country, would not be successful without this partnership between those of us in the field and the network and this board and the support you've given us and the department. It really takes all three to be successful. I've done a ton of presentations around the country. We're the only remaining network in the Milken system. We're unique as a broad network. That only works because there are three pieces to this. You as a board, us as a group of educators who care deeply and have been recognized for their caring, and the department. And there are a couple of people that are leaving that really have been critical to that. One is Eileen. Thank you, Eileen. You've been very supportive, very helpful all the way down the road, trying to <laughs> sort of keep me in line where the board's concerned and been very supportive to Jean, but <clears throat> I'll probably have a hard time with this. We would not be successful if it wasn't for the department's support through Mike, through Jean. Jean Shane has been a remarkable person in, in carrying the, helping carry the network forward. Every time I do something, it looks like I'm going to step in it. She says, hey, you're going to step in it, and <laughs> don't do it. Um, and that has been incredibly helpful, but having a person inside the department that can help us figure this out and make it possible for us to be of service to you as a department and a board has been an incredible gift to education in Michigan. We had this great idea. We've been able to carry it off because it's supported in, at this table and it's supported in this department and it's supported by someone. Now, you're going to have to find somebody, you know, to take her place, Mike. This is, this is our request. Yes. We really need to have a liaison. Uh, this organization is not going away. I'm no longer chair. June Tyson, who sat in that chair a couple of years ago, is now the team leader for the network. But... What it's all about is collaboration. And in today's world, we're not ever going to succeed if we don't collaborate because there just aren't enough resources around to every, for anybody to do it on their own. So here we are. We're the network. We're here to be there for you. Jean has been there for us. She's a remarkable person. We're going to miss her. But maybe we'll find a way to keep her active in the network some way. So then maybe she can still be active, you know, in education. Anyway, thank you for educators in the field. You've made a tremendous difference. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thank, thank you. you. I just briefly say uh, more in a general way that 
I've got to be careful how I say these things because I, I think we're going to be fine ultimately, and I don't. I think Liz made an excellent point a moment ago about there's still lots of things we can do, for instance, with Bully Pulpit, a uh, perfect example where the board's voice would be very helpful in, in helping local boards and some of what we talked about today, more push out to state board, to, mm -hmm. to, to board presidents. I do want to say on behalf of the folks that are left that we're going to have more of this testimony. Um, the two Davids, the first David, uh, you know, when you are when you have budget directives that you can replace half of what you lose, mm -hmm. you, you give up position. <coughs> it's just the nature of the beast. Um, when Eileen leaves, to say the least, uh, it's a giant vacuum. You know, these things don't happen by accident. It's an amazing uh, project that takes weeks into making that is led by Eileen with Mertz's help. And then even Dave's point, I mean, you know, I mean, no one more than me would wish we could just replace Gene and just replace Eileen and just go that route. But I, I, I'm just kind of preparing us that mm -hmm. there'll be more of this testimony and a little bit that we'd appreciate and feel we get from you, by the way, and thank you for that, is, is a little bit of cushion from when, when you get this in the field or even on days like today that it is what it is. I mean, we were a department of a couple of thousand and now we're a department of a couple of hundred and, and getting smaller. And most of those are, as you know, federally, 90% are federal folks with very specific functions that we can't use for state work. So, but I, I it is, a, it, when we meet Fridays at the superintendent's group, we're struggling with this. I'm not going to pretend. I've, as David said, I was the superintendent of Farmington 20 years ago and at RESA, nothing like this have we ever faced nothing close to this. I do think in the spirit of what Liz said earlier, it, it, we feel this too in our subgroup meetings, that there's opportunities with crisis like this to actually improve things. So I, this isn't doom and gloom. I'm just saying though that things like not replacing a specific position is out of our hands to some degree. It's a budget issue and uh, we're going to do the best we can. Uh, you know, like, Mike, I read in the paper uh, something that was reported that Governor-elect Snyder said that he was going to review the replacing one, two for one, one for two, I mean. And uh, he's going to look at the function of the person that's gone and will review that and maybe that person, you know, that position can be replaced. So I, I would start making a case for these because he'll listen to cases. Yeah. I think we have his ear on that very issue. I think that we've helped influence uh, some of that thinking on his part because I think uh, uh, with no malice but a budget decision that's based on randomness of mm -hmm. retirements is, is in fairness at the end of an administration it's harder to get something resolved in the short time that, that, that a lame duck governor had. But I am hopeful. I do think uh, we're hitting a cliff though. So while he's saying that on the one hand, I believe he's sincere about that, the funding cliff based on federal funds stopping now is going to be in addition to this. So what we, you know, I mean, I think one thing uh, that I don't know much about his when he t talks about the value budgeting, for example, but I think the idea that there's whole functions that we're going to have to decide as a state we don't do anymore rather than what I call boiling the frog, which is that you still try to keep doing everything but with fewer people and then the fewer people who are left leave because they just can't handle it. You know the story about the frog. Yeah, and, and we know that. I guess I'd be that. But I, so if he reconsiders, that would be great. What we, what, we, what we don't know is what will be the backfill then to replace what would have been saved there. Uh, ideally, it would be whole parts of government outside of education that might have to be reduced in order to cover that. And we'll, we'll I think an innovative look is going to be helpful and we'll take a step at a time. Mm -hmm. Well, I think Mr. Hale's point about the importance of the social studies person is very valid. Yeah. I certainly would support anything we can do to keep that position. And or when work, or if not, to use the organizations that he mentioned. Yeah, I that, think that's I think absolutely critical. Yeah. No, I think he's offering uh, options that we could probably yes, work with. Right. 
<clears throat> but I'll just, I would just say every position we're going to eliminate, there isn't an unimportant one. I don't know if there ever has been the last five years, but there's certainly none anymore. Uh, every single one of them is detrimental to our functioning. But hey, I, David is a good thinker. I knew him as a young man when he first got into teaching. And uh, if David's got some ideas, uh, both Davids are good thinkers, by the way. But uh, David Hale, I meant, he's probably going to offer some solutions that might involve those other associations. I mean, we'd take one on loan a year at a time. Maybe there's something like that where they, you know, we, we had some folks from ISDs here on helping Patty on uh, crosswalking the, uh, uh, at the time that we went to high school requirements and wanted to have the two years career tech sequence satisfy some of the so-called academics. So maybe that'll be a way to solve some of this. Mm -hmm. There has oh. to be a way. Yeah. Well, so there's a will. Mm -hmm. There's a way. We'll have, to, we'll have to work on that together, that's for sure. Okay, now I'm, uh, now I'm going to the approval of the amendments to the Michigan Accountability <coughs> Workbook with Sally and Joseph and Vanessa. And, uh, you know, they were here, as you know, before and today's the day for the actual action and then we would submit the accountability workbook to the U.S. Department of Education. Um, the October meeting, if you recall, was when we presented this to the board two months ago. It's submitted now for approval uh, with a few minor revisions that were identified to the board at the October meeting. <coughs> Sally, I think I'm getting actually into some of your issues. So yes, you are. Do we only have five minutes, Eileen? I'm sorry? Do we only have five I, minutes? I, didn't want, well, I won't start it. I just haven't. Uh, <laughs> That's a good idea, though. Is that what um, you want? <laughs> this work, uh, it's a good idea, thank uh, The workbook should not be foreign to you. You've seen it uh, when we were back here. Um, you had uh, suggested we make a couple of uh, adjustments, which we had done, that were defined in the, in the October board meeting. And those uh, adjustments are reflected in the cover memo. So. I think at this point, rather than going through it in detail again, if you've got questions, we'd be certainly. Cassandra, please. I actually have a couple of questions. One is, is there a deadline by which this is required for the feds? Um, yes, but I don't know when it is. Early January? It's January? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, my concern with it was um, the heavy inclusion of the MySAS, which I completely understand why it's in there, um, but the fact that it hasn't passed the legislature yet and we're going to have a completely new legislature next year, I guess my question is, is it premature to put all of the MySAS stuff in there or is there a way that, well I guess I'm going to ask just a multiple questions, what happens if we send it to the feds and then it doesn't pass the legislature? Well, let's, let's do a couple things. If um, we need to send it, so we send it in, uh, they approve it. If the legislature does not uh, pass the MISAS, then we can go in and, and make a revision. Okay. To the and the technical board. amendments. A technical amendment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we, we have the ability to do that then? Yes. Okay. I would, I would add this. That would assume that the, uh, that the board accepts uh, their limited authority in that regard. What does that explain that? Well, um, I think that's up to you, but if that were to happen at the legislative committee level, I think, you know, you've reminded me and others regularly of your role according to the Constitution um, as a state board. And I'm not clear, we're not clear, at least in-house, that uh, we don't have to deal with this right now because it may do just fine. Yeah, this might be a premature conversation to have. So, but I, I, my it. concern really was, if we send this to the federal government and then it doesn't go through, what do we do? And if, if we can make amendments, then you know that's that's good. But if I think we need to make sure, if we can't make amendments, then we need to rethink whether we want to put this much detail in there. Well, I think we, we can make amendments, obviously, but also there, there is, I remember we looked at the language pretty closely. There's a legitimate um, question over who's got the last word on this, with probably the favor of the state board has the last word on what the, the uh, expectations are with the accreditation system and the legislature's role is potentially advisory and uh, reviewing, but not the last word. Uh, so that was, that was Mike's suggestion is push comes to shove, we can have a constitutional fight over who's got the last word here. I don't think we're, we're going to have that, but. 
I'm not, I'm not recommending that. I, I'm, I'm saying there's really two things. One would be the revision if you wanted to stand by whatever their action was. But I think not necessarily just for my SAS, that there may be an important discussion to have about the role of the board versus a legislature in some areas that you brought up before. Uh, it would, it, but, I, but that would be for you to determine, and I'm not necessarily recommending that we don't accept their, their verdict on that, I guess, if that's the right way to think about it. Um, it could have ramifications for other uh, issues related to your authority versus, especially when it's not the entire legislature, it's the committee of the legislature that in effect can supersede the board's will. Um, so I, it's, it's less issue, from my point of view, this isn't about that issue. This issue may stand on its own with, with the board accepting the, the verdict of the legislature and that would be fine. There, but there may be some issues in thinking about the role of the state board versus a committee of a legislature that's worth some debate. I'm not sure about a constitutional crisis, but uh, <laughs> at least some discussion. It, last question, <coughs> would it make sense to put a statement in here that this is still moving through the process and that it, um, you know, some, well, some form of um, this is, it, I know it says proposed, but maybe a stronger statement saying that this is a proposed um, accreditation system that has to go through a couple additional <coughs> steps before we can implement. Well, that's one reason I brought that up because I'm, please, I should. I, I think what this is, though, is, and, and correct me, uh, please, if, I, if I've misunderstood, um, but I think this is what the board and the department wants to see happen. And so in our mind, it's not proposed. It's what we want to see happen. The fact that the legislation is required to make it actually take place is something else. But I think if we get into the, the business of, of um, entering into um, a, um, reports or requests or workbook assessments or whatever it is with the Department of Education federally and, and put into it what also might happen in our state, then we have lessened our impact for what the board at the state level and the department at the state level wants to see happen. <coughs> and I'd like to have us keep our authority, not muddy it with everything else. I don't think it, th I'm guessing that many other states have that situation too, Cassandra, but I'd like to keep our authority clear that this is what we want to see happen. And then, and, and then, that that is certainly a powerful statement, mm -hmm. but what we'd like to see happen doesn't always get to happen. I understand so that, that's but that's not concern. what this is about. Cassandra, Dan I'm sorry, Nance. To answer your question, I think proposed would handle that. It says proposed in the workbook. Yep. Does it? Mm -hmm. I'm asking it rather proposed. than. But to Nancy's point, it may say this already. I mean, it's perfectly accurate and appropriate exactly. to say this is the okay. accreditation okay. system approved by the State Board of Education. Mm -hmm. to, it's under review by the relevant legislative committees per whatever law. That's the truth. That's mm -hmm. what's happening. That could be included. I, I agree with Nancy totally. We want to do nothing that suggests that our state board, that we have you know, internally, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a unanimous vote on that right. accreditation system, but the state board policy approved is this accreditation system, mm -hmm. period. And it is under review by legislative committees per the statute. So that's fine. And my question has nothing to do with the fact that this was not a unanimous no, no, vote. I'm just this saying is that. about what is oh, yeah. legally required. Yeah. Yeah. I would just say uh, I've had a pretty direct conversation just in my role uh, with the Ed <laughs> Alliance. I'm not representing others in this, but you see, from our point of view, there's interest represented here regularly that will take part in reference groups and get a shot at developing this more than frankly the staff develops it. So we develop this based on a reference group and then the reference group comes and meets with the board and tries to get changes that maybe they didn't get unanimously through a reference group. And then when that doesn't work, I'm just telling it as it is, our now work in the legislature to try to get that changed at that level. We just need to understand what we're dealing with and there's a bigger issue here which is what is really the authority of the state board. No matter what this particular issue is, this may be one to let play out and let, you know, if it doesn't, if it doesn't satisfy the legislators committees, maybe that's the reason to not fight that. But there is a bigger issue here and from my point of view it's not 
it's your decision ultimately on the constitutional issue. My point is, I can't, I, I, this is as direct as I said it to the, to the that Alliance. It was a little uncomfortable that day, but I don't know how we have to reinvent the way we're working with folks that they can't get, keep getting two and three and four shots at something when in fact we're even giving up some of our authority as staff in order to have a referent group work on a proposal over two years and then some members of that same referent group come in and fight it at a board meeting and then fight it at a legislative committee. So, you know, another alternative would be that we bring in what the staff thinks is the best resolution to that. And then, frankly, that's fine. You know, I do think that I'm not taking away, hell, I was, heck, I was one of those folks. So I'm not taking away the right to, to have your voice heard. But one of the things we're thinking about in-house is maybe we need to bring you our best thinking on this, and then those associations and others can come in and tell the board why they may not agree. And that would be healthy. But right now, I feel like we're between a rock and a hard place because as staff, we take all that advice, basically put together a proposal that's a consensus proposal built in this case over two years by constituent groups, and then they have a shot at it, and then another shot at it. So this isn't about the board. That's, that's your concern. Right. But this is in this little sub part of it is, is I'm leaning more towards that we'll develop a proposal with our in-house expertise bring it to the board, and then others appropriately would have a shot to say to the board, we think here's a mistake, well-intentioned maybe, but we think the, the staff and the superintendent are off base on item X. I mean, item X, frankly, on this one, in large part is the AYP that the board decided to include. So we've decided as a staff that it's our job to support the board's position on that, and we've done that aggressively. It, it, it ironically may not have been the position that we would have brought in on a, if we had made our own proposal. I mean, I don't, we didn't, you know, we didn't do it that way. But you know what I mean? So it, it, I've got to find ways that we're, we allow the proper kind of democracy really to work, which is all these interests should have a right to let the board know, please don't make that decision without our thinking taken into account. I'm just worried about it coming into account two and three times. And that's what I've, so I, my direct discussion, and we're going to follow up on it, is how do we think about this in a way that helps all the parties work? And, and it wouldn't take anything away from them if we just brought our own proposal in as a department, because they'd have the right at this meeting then to say, you know, maybe well-intentioned, but we think what Mike and the staff have brought in won't serve you well, and they make the points as they've made. But our frustration is that it, it comes two and three times, and that's what we've got to try to sort through ourselves. Because there's, there's absolute reason for healthy debate on this. Um, I, think the, mm -hmm. I think the fear of the consequences is a little bit overblown, by the way. You'd have to be three years in a row unaccredited to have any consequences, mm -hmm. and it's just not really likely to happen when you look at that. But, but nevertheless, I'm not saying there isn't reason for healthy debate, and, and, but it, it's, as I'm saying, one might be that we bring in our best thinking and then let everyone come to the board as they may see fit and say, you know, we just don't agree with this piece. You know, Association of Superintendents, Association of Teachers or whatever, that, and, and, and let the board decide. That might, that, might that might be where we have to go because otherwise what we're doing is two years of trying to get consensus and even putting items in a proposal to you that technically is my recommendation, but there's pieces in that recommendation sometimes that I may not even agree with, but I'm thinking, you know what, if that was the consensus of the group, there's probably some value to it. And so I'm just describing another way. It doesn't have anything to do with this particular issue because I, I think your point's well taken. We should be clearer in that. John, I, you could, I think John described a way that would do it. And, uh, and then let this other thing kind of play out. I mean, we're just going to continue to uh, make a presentation uh, when the committees do meet uh, related to supporting the board's position on this. And then it goes where it goes. You know, I mean, I, as I said, there's room for disagreement on this issue. but. But our job at this point as a staff is to support the board's position. That's what we're doing. Yep. You, you know I've had a lot of misgivings about this, and um, I still do. Um, I think it's it's very punitive in nature. Um, I, I, I don't like the idea of putting off um, corrections on it. And... Um, so I'm, I'm planning on voting no on this. We need to get a motion on the floor before we can plan okay. anything. I would move that we approve the amendments to the Michigan Accountability Workbook as presented. 
support, uh, moved by Nancy, supported by John. Fine language in the motion per the discussion that make sure that this includes the Fair. statement of the MISAS board approved policy under review by the legisla relevant reg legislative committees per statute. If that Fair. language, the motion, yeah, that's fine. amend the motion to include yeah. that. Yeah, that's, that's good, fine. Cassandra. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> okay. <then> A discussion. <coughs> Kath, please. I, as you know, I voted no on my sense because I agreed with the points that Cassandra had raised, and I had some misgivings about it too, obviously. And it's possible that when the legislative committees review this, uh, there'll be new people looking at it. It won't be the, you know, there'll be a lot of new members of the education committees. So it's possible that they may see things and raise questions that are le very legitimate. And we might want to take another look at it. As a result, I, well, if they don't approve it, we would have to. But well, even if we may have to, we may, we may have to. Yeah, uh, well, that would be your call. Right, but they may raise questions that are yeah. that, that so make a lot of sense. So then we'll deal with so them when they come. Right. So, okay. but, so uh, that's a, so it is possible that we'll have another look at this. Yes. Yeah, and I think the language, if I could clarify, there may be other things that Marianne, for instance, is, is concerned about in this, but if it was strictly MySAS, I'm just expressing a thought that if it was strictly the MySAS, the MySAS isn't done one way or the other mm -hmm. anyway. It's either because you'll accept the legislative thing or not, and there's there's a way out through the rewording. And I would it would be it would be um, in, unless there's there's other. Uh, that's the word I'm looking for. Unless there's other objections to it, and there may be, the help we would appreciate would be being able to send this in on a timely basis. It is contingent upon MySAS actually getting through an approval process, either legislature or, or revision on your part. If there are other items in the book, then that's a different issue. But I, I hope we could get a yes vote if it was strictly MySAS, because it doesn't take away the opportunity to, to reflect on that again. And I would encourage us to vote on the Michigan Accountability, work, Accountability Workbook, mm -hmm. and uh, as you say, we, we may the we may revisit the MISAS, and yeah. we'll have a different board too in a couple months yeah. too. So, but uh, as of now, that's where we are. I would encourage us to vote on that. Sending it to Washington. So call the question. Yeah. yeah. Call the question. Um, you call the question. All in favor, aye. Uh, aye. Opposed, same. No. Thank you. I think that passes. Mm -hmm. I was one no up on that. So, okay. But I, in a way, you know, we've been sitting on this the last few meetings with the with Soup's group, and I think it was it, it, we're not advocating any of these positions. By the way, I, I want to be clear about that. I think the board has the right number one to revisit, of course, and the whole deal. We were just trying to say that if anything, we're in a position right now, which we felt. Um, we felt at a meeting a few months ago as if the board might have thought that we weren't uh, presenting with vigor um, the position that you had taken. And once it's taken, whether it's unanimous or majority vote, we're clear on following it with vigor <coughs> and supporting it, and we've done so. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I, I don't know if this is helpful or hurtful to say, but even if, as I said, there's issues that we wouldn't agree with 100 percent, because I think if the staff at that time had made a bit of a different recommendation, if you recall, along with the uh, MISAS group. But also, was, you, you raised a, a related but different issue, which is a large issue of sort of how we, uh, as a board, want to see policy developed and decisions presented and discussed here which we've revisited several times during my tenure on the board, including prior to your superintendency, which is um, we ask the superintendent and the staff to manage a process that involves all the stakeholders and then come to their best, uh, not necessarily compromise, but actually come to a recommendation that you, superintendent and staff, stand behind after that process of consultation. That's one way of but it's your recommendation after your, on our behalf, process of consultation, deliberation with all the stakeholders, but you're still coming with your best sense of here's the recommendation we believe in after this consultation or, you know, the alternative you, you, you um, proposed was you as superintendent and staff come to your best recommendation to us and then let 
stakeholders yeah. weigh in. Those are two very different policy development approaches. So I think we, before we change or proceed in one direction or another, we should have a lot more discussion about what's the most effective policy development process. Yeah. I, I just think, if I may, that to that point, you never really get clarity from the staff under the existing right. process. You never really understand clearly what our recommendation is, mm -hmm. because even though you're saying, John, the right thing in a sense that, that it's our recommendation, once you've gone through a consensus building process, it's, it's uh, when I was on the other side of it, I would have taken it as uh, uh, an affront. Mm -hmm. You would have taken it as an affront. An affront an and, and, mm -hmm. and just not real. Mm -hmm. So I mean, that's why, it, I don't think it would, if I were in my other, my previous job, um, in some ways there'd be an advantage that I could speak directly to the board based on a presentation and a firm recommendation <laughs> from the staff that there be no question that it was filtered somehow or whatever. And, and I'm not saying one's better than the okay. other. And I'm also saying, you know, suggesting there may be third, fourth, and fifth variants, right. which is this is a compromised position. We are not, uh, you know, there's some things I, as superintendent, disagree with, but this is the best we could do. Or this is the best we could do with all stakeholders, and it is something I totally recommend. Okay. Or this is my recommendation from staff and the superintendent, now let's hear from the stakeholders. And there may be five or six other permutations on how policy gets developed and presented. And I think it's up to us as a board with you to decide what's the approach that, and maybe it's different approaches on different topics, but what's the approach that we think works in the best interest of the best outcome? And that's a, bit, that's a different, that's a broader discussion mm -hmm. about how to proceed in this work, so. Okay. <laughs> Well, that's helpful as well. We'll get to. Uh, <laughs> I thought this was going to be just a celebration day. <laughs> We're getting there. Well. We're crunching along towards <laughs> it. And uh, the, so the next item is approval of the Michigan School for the Blind Trust Fund spending plan. I at, the, at the October 10th meeting, the Michigan School for the Blind Trust Fund committee meeting, members reviewed the 2010-11 spending plan for the camp. So the approval of this spending plan is by the entire board, and I know Carol and Rick and Alex are joining us, and I know uh, board members uh, have been involved too. So, I would move approval of the Michigan School for the Blind <laughs> Trust Fund spending plan for 2010. Well, you got to do that before you have a good okay. discussion. 2010-2011 support. Now we Move can. Finance is supported <laughs> by <laughs> Liz. Uh, discussion. I support today. Well, okay. You want Carol to say? I'd be happy to say something. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, and I'm really f grateful for that opportunity because um, this is Rick Floria's last meeting as well. Um, he's been our financial management director for quite some time. He's already lost his entire budget staff to the incentive retirement. So when he leaves on December 16th, we'll be rebuilding. Um, and we've already started that process. But thank you, Rick, um, from me. And I know that the board has appreciated your work as well. So thank you very much. Rick, do you just, I don't know if this is fair game, and I, here I'm asking you something, and if you're not comfortable, but I think it's fine. <laughs> 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 Look how it ready no. yeah. the, the new, isn't it the new budget director that uh, Governor Lex Snyder has chosen was looking at different houses, and one of them was yours, right? We thought it was a perfect oh. fit, budget to budget. <laughs> yeah. yes. Well, it has good heritage. It does. Well, it has dollar signs for light fixtures. <laughs> <laughs> um, very, very quickly, um, we're asking your approval today for the um, Camp Tushmahita or Camp T as we call it spending plan. And there is a, a State Board of Education um, subcommittee that works on that. Um, Mrs. Bauer, um, Marianne McGuire, um, and Kathy Strauss. And so they are intimately aware of it and, and have approved this spending plan to, to bring to you. Alex DeVlentes is our um, in-house resident expert on all of our property issues. So um, with that, this is, this is a, a, a spending plan that we bring to you every year. I don't know um, if Mrs. Bauer, or Mrs. Strauss, or Marianne McGuire would like to say anything. Well, well I, I would, know. I'm yeah, go, I was, go ahead, Liz, <laughs> okay. Marianne. Whoever wants Liz, to be first. Okay. okay. Well, I just want to take this minute <laughs> to say thank you. This has been a real privilege to serve on the Trust Fund Committee, and I will be leaving that committee, be, be leaving the board service this year. 
And I and I really want to commend Alex and Rick and and Bruce and the people at the camp that make it possible. Pat Cannon is here the, uh, mm. from the Commission for the Blind, mm. and so Pat, I want you to hear this as well. But uh, over the years, we've made some wonderful improvements to the camp. <coughs> uh, I commend both these gentlemen for taking field trips with us to do. Yes. You know, not everybody <laughs> wants to go on field trips with board members who want to troop to go <laughs> <laughs> and be picky about what they see. But um, uh, no, it's it's really been a wonderful partnership between the department, the trustees of the trust fund, the use of the money has been judicious, and the camp this summer, I think, had one of its best seasons in a long, long time. So thank you for all of your gifts. I'm glad you're going to be around. Wish you a great retirement. You can go to Camp T for vacation. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it's got a lot of nice grounds. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Ann was next. Oh, thank you. Um, Rick, I just want to say how wonderful it's been to rely on you, to trust you, and um, to work with you on, on this committee. It's been a lot of years. Yes. And uh, we've, we've been through a lot of wars together. <laughs> but it's, uh, I feel we came out um, okay on all of this. And, um, We've been able to save a lot of money, I think, for the yeah. for the trust fund, and uh, I'm glad you and Alex will still be working together, and that we'll be seeing you. So thank you so much for everything. Well, I would like okay. to, Kath, I'd like to echo what what Liz and Marianne have said. We've taken our responsibility very seriously, and we have tried to upgrade the camp, and I think we have in a, a very positive way. We've got better management of it now, better control of it, and, and we depended on on you, Rick, so much, for, and Alex, too, but of course, he, you're not retiring, or you did once, but you're not. <laughs> Maybe you can come back, too, in another guy's Rick. <laughs> that would be good. But uh, he's moving. Yeah. Where are you? You're apparently selling your house? You're moving out of town? I hope to. <laughs> oh. Hmm. We'll have to find out all the details of it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we did review this. The committee did review this spending plan very carefully and asked a lot of questions, got a lot of answers, and uh, we recommend it. So. But I do want to add my thanks to you, Rick. It's been a pleasure working with you. Thank you. We wish you well. We'll miss you. We're going to miss so many people. It's, I know. It's scary mm -hmm. <laughs> to think that so many good people are, are retiring. Mm -hmm. So be careful what you wish for with this retire early retirement mm -hmm. business. It worked out too well for the state in, in one way with the budget and terrible for us. So. Anyway, I urge a yes vote on this. Any further Thank discussion? You. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. And Rick, before you leave, if you're, Rick is really kind of a good example of what I think is a, most of the, all of the MDE employees, modest, hardworking, uh, I don't know how to describe it. I mean, it's going to be a big loss, as has already been said. Ruthlessly okay. competent. Yeah. <laughs> Ruthlessly competent. That's a good way to put it. So thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Thank everyone. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Uh, oh. Oh, Lisa, Thank you. come on, your turn. Lisa provided the board with a legislative update, but I think going to highlight a few items for us. And then we're going to be right on target, like we planned this. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, just a couple of wrap up items. The um, Edge of Jobs bill, the bill that had all the Edge of Jobs money, the Adair uh, funding to pay for the Adair um, data collection because of that court case. 
and um, some other technical fixes related to maintenance of effort and some transfers did pass in the wee late hours of the last night of session and has already been signed into law. So our staff are already working on um, doing what they need to do to distribute that money. It's around $246 million to the local school districts. If you remember, this was part of a bill previously that the governor vetoed because the federal government sent a letter saying the um, formula by which the legislature had appropriated it in the earlier version was not appropriate, essentially. And so they did a different kind of formula, which I described a bit in uh, the update before you, and that's now passed and been signed into law. Um, just a couple of other quick highlights because we've had a couple of meetings and, and since Senator Cassis came and presented, I wanted to let you know that unfortunately her bill made it over to the House but and they were trying to get a discharge to get it moved on that last day of session but it did not move and so uh, I'm not sure if she's working with um, some other, um, oftentimes the senator coming in for that district will introduce the bills from the previous <laughs> senator um, or if someone else will pick it up. My guess is someone else will pick it up because it's a pretty good bill. Um, but we'll hopefully see that in the next session. And uh, the only other thing I wanted to note was the Child Nutrition Act, they're still talking about a vote in lame duck. I, I, you know, I don't know if that's going to happen. There's so little time left, but it could still happen. I thought I read that the child, yeah, that the nutrition that act was Did it get passed? Fair. And I, I missed it. it. You're more ahead than I am. <laughs> yeah. um, I, from, I think we got it from NASB. It that, uh, the, um, the only other thing I wanted to go over real quick was what we know so far about leadership in the next session, mm -hmm. which is um, we know that in the Senate it'll be Randy Richardville as majority leader, the Senate majority leader, and Gretchen Whitmer as the minority leader. The chair of approps in the Senate side is going to be Roger Kahn, Senator Roger Kahn. Um, I believe he has an education background, so uh, that could be a plus for us. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, I have not. He's not <laughs> been on uh, education committees before, so he's not someone I've I've necessarily worked closely with. On the House side, uh, Speaker Jace Bolger James, and he's called Jace J A S E, but his mm -hmm. name is James Bolger. Uh, on the Republican side, and the minority leader is Richard Hamill, who did serve on the um, subcommittee that covered our budget. Mm -hmm. So he's already knowledgeable about the MDE budget and the school aid budget as well, so that'll be helpful to us. Um, and the chair of approps is Chuck Moss, who also served on um, the subcommittee on the MDE and school aid budget. So he'll already have some, some background knowledge. We don't know yet, though, who's going to be specifically the House or Senate Education Chair or the chair of the subcommittees overlooking our budgets. Um, once I know that, I, I will, of course, um, forward that information out to you. Um, but we don't have it as of yet. Who are the Democratic leaders in the House? In the House, it is Richard Hamill is the minority leader. Oh, I'm sorry. Mess that up. Never mind. No, it's okay. Uh, Mike? Yes, ma'am. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I just wanted, uh, yesterday I got an email from our National Association of State Boards of, that the um, Senate's Labor, Health, and Human Services bill will cut the, it's supposed to be voted on on the 18th, and they're having a 4 o'clock. Uh, emergency conference call this afternoon on this, but what it will cut is the, um, oh, wait a minute, I want to get the exact roads, the funding for uh, school health programs. And the cost to Michigan would be uh, $769,483 as the uh, state appropriation, but the city of Detroit also is a recipient of funding under that, and they get currently 59043 dollars um, that and both would be this is all the school health money mm -hmm. that there is and um, I don't know if we're contacting our senators on on this as as a department I know as individuals we is that you said that was from NASB mm -hmm. yeah this, forward there's that to a me? four o'clock conference call today that they're calling for an emergency call because the um, the FY 2011 Labor, Health, and Human Services and Education Appropriations Bill, Senate 3686, contains proposed language that would eliminate funding for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's Division of Adolescent and School Health. So if they wipe out the Division of Adolescent and School Health, that wipes out each of the state's money 
for school health programs and it's almost a million dollars for the state of Michigan between Detroit and I can I can share this with you that it, would be great it has all the detail rather than spread it out here that would be but it's pretty uh, that would be uh, pretty dire yeah we should be doing some we should at least contact our senators on that I think. yeah yeah I think I said this at the last month also, but as, you, as we work on food and nutrition, remember that our own Senator Stabenow is now going to be the chair of that committee in the new yeah, session. Agriculture. Yeah. That should be helpful. Hopeful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank okay. you, yeah, Lisa. Thanks, thanks Lisa. Uh, thank you, Lisa. You know, our next item is the consent agenda. Uh, as a kind of a personal privilege, uh, it's a consent agenda with 59 folks who are retiring from the department. And each of them have a unique resolution that has been crafted for them, and they're going to be given this. It's, 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 so it, it may feel a little bit like it's all in one shot, but these are unique resolutions that have been written with each person individually in mind. Read them all. And also, I asked as best we could to get, if we could get the timing right, and I know a bunch of them are here today, and I would just ask the board to stand, uh, to, to, no, we won't stand yet, because I'd like our retirees who've served MDE so well who are here with us right now to stand up so that we can recognize you please would you well, please could they introduce themselves who's leaving individually who's so we know who they are Introduce Thank you. yourselves. We know we have had some of you come to the table over the years, and we know you, and some of you we don't see. So I wondered if, I mean, I see Nancy there. I haven't seen you in a long time, but you used to be with us a lot. <laughs> so I mean, we're going to miss so many of you. Yeah, it's just all. incredible to me that the talent and the, the, the knowledge and the commitment that's going to be lost here and I know we're going to have wonderful people left but we have to tell you how much you have meant not only to the board but to the people of the state of Michigan and I hope you know that that you are appreciated but I wondered if all of you could stand up individually and tell us who you are because we've got the resolutions we know some of you, but not all. So could we do that? Please? Sure. Yeah. Those of you, why don't we do that? Just yeah. we'll start over here, and Kathy's asking to maybe your, you know. What, what you, you name and, are, and your function. name and your. I'm Kat Everett, and I work with the Office of Educational Assessment and Accountability. I've been here for 31 years. Wow. Uh, Thank you. Different Thank programs you. And Thank you, Pat. Thanks, Pat. Education Early Intervention Services, and I've been here 34 years. Yeah. Oh, I'm Lynn Snellman. I'm currently with the Michigan with the Office of Special Education Early Intervention Services. I've been in a lot of other units, and I've been here just a little bit over 20 years. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Alice. Hi, Mary Alice Galloway, and I have literally worked all over the Department of Education. <laughs> <laughs> 21 years that I've been here, and it's been a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Please, please. I'm Teresa Abbott, and I work in the Office of Human Resources. I've been here 33 years, all in human resources. Thank you. Nancy Minsmeyer, I've been here for three and a half years, and started out in on the instructional specialist program and gifted education work with math and science. The HR director actually returned from the service position. Thank you. Sandy, we, Sandy, you came in a little late. Hi. I work in the superintendent's office. I've been working for the state for 32 years. Ooh, Thank yeah. you. 
Dr. Izana, I saw, oh, Char, of course. Charlie Derrick, I work in the superintendent's office and I've been here almost 35 years. Oh my goodness. It's fountain of knowledge. I've been here for 23 years, most recently in the arts education consultant and previously with the King Chavez Association. I'm Bonnie Rockefeller, been here 12 years. <laughs> Um, currently with the Office of Professional Preparation Services. Um, I'm Rosemary Sardini, and I've been with the Department of Education for 30 years. First of all, in higher education, student financial assistance, and most recently with the Child and Adult Pursuit Program. And prior to the department, I had five years with Northern Michigan University. Jean, uh, I think you probably heard Dave earlier. <laughs> I'm trying, but I know you've avoided this meeting on purpose, but we'll yes, put and I didn't bring my Kleenex with me. I know. <laughs> I'm Jean Shane, and I've been with the department for 22 years. I started out as the non-public homeschool consultant and worked with data issues and publications that were in print, not online. <laughs> and I'm now with the Stateway School Reform and Redesign Office. recognition and of course that's right where my heart is with all the teacher recognition because we know teachers are the single most important factor influencing student achievement in the classroom. So thank you very much. Ken, we see you back here. You can't hide. Come on. Oh, you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Ken Rademacher. I've been here for 32 years. I work in um, financial management. all of our folks to join us at the reception because we want to also honor them along with our two board members that are that are leaving or three board members if Reggie gets here because you, you, when you hear the names and the numbers of years it's just incredible and as Kath said we can't thank you enough for your service to the kids of this state to the entire citizens of this state and we'll miss you very much but one more time can we give them a That's right. Well, All in favor. Now that we know. I move the consent are. agenda, including these resolutions for these wonderful people who we thank for your service. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Any further business? Um, my, yes. My husband and one of our daughters came in. Carolyn, what? Uh, yes. Personal privilege that to put Joe on the spot. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> There really is a man that was behind me all the way, my husband Joe, and our, one of our daughters, Chrissy. I know. We'll adjourn to the reception in honor of not only our board members, but the staff that are leaving, and this is their last meeting. Thanks so much.